think I'd let a Thursday go by without a brand new episode of the podcast devoted to the classic and sometimes not so classic genre cinema of yesteryear. You wouldn't think I'd let a Thursday go by without an episode of Monster Kid Radio. You didn't think I'd let a Thursday go by without playing a little bit of surf music. This song is Goat's Eye. It's from the band Mullet Monster Mafia. One of my favorite finds of this year when it comes to surf music to play here on the show. They gave us permission to play their music here. You can find them at mmmbrazil.bandcamp.com. Now they're based in Brazil. Check out Mullet Monster Mafia. Check out the album Inferno when you're done listening to this podcast. What's up, everybody? My name is Eric M. Cook, your writer, host, producer, content creator, curator, and, well, um, yeah, I got nothing else. Anyway, welcome to the podcast. I know I'm a little late. Normally, I like to have this podcast out early Thursday morning, if not late the night before on Wednesday, but I'm adjusting to a new quote-unquote day job work schedule and packing and moving. So some things got pushed back a little bit when I'm done with the workday, even though it's work from home. I am exhausted, and it's just tough to find the oomph to do everything that needs to be done. But no more excuses. Let's get the podcast out to you. This week, we are dipping back into the archives, back into the uh, backlog of audio that I've captured over the years and never released on the podcast. I did not have an opportunity to edit the regular episode that I had. You know what? I'm making excuses again. Here's what you get this week. (laughs) Here's what's coming up this week. Back in 2019, in March, Portland's queer horror brought in two Vincent Price films and Victoria Price. They showed two movies, one each night. They showed House on Haunted Hill and House of Wax. And on each night, Victoria Price spoke and answered questions. It was a cool little Q&A. And it was one of the things that I like, you know, I went to and it was a lot of fun. I love seeing Victoria. I love listening to Victoria. She just, I don't know. There's just something about the way she speaks and the words and the thoughts that she shares that, that really kind of shake me to my core. And I don't know what it is. I don't know why it is other than uh, she just really... I don't know. I don't want to say she gets me, but maybe I get her. I don't know. But if you haven't read her book, The Way of Being Lost, I tell you, I mean, it came out a couple of years ago, but that book has meant so much to me. I have never, and I, I don't mind admitting this, I've teared up a few times. And even just thinking about a particular passage and a description of an event uh, from her childhood when she and her family were flying from Europe back home, and her father couldn't make a particular piece of artwork fit in their carry-on or in their luggage. So he, uh, okay, spoiler alert, he broke it to make it fit and had every intention of putting it back together and rebuilding it when it, they got where they needed to be. And, you know, that analogy about, well, everything that I've been going through the past couple of years has been very, uh, I'm doing it again. <laughs> Oh, man. Victoria Price is awesome. Anyway, so you got a Q&A with Victoria, and that's what's going to be in this week's episode. Of course, we've got another beta capsule review from Mark Matsky. He's still rocking the Ultraman, and, you know, even if I'm disorganized and I don't have all my act together to put together a new episode, he's constantly banging it out. So, Mark, thanks for making me look good this week. (laughs) Uh, As always, we are open to feedback here at Monster Kid Radio. You can call and leave a voicemail for Monster Kid Radio at 503-810-5MKR. That's 503-810-5657. Or you can send an email to the podcast. MonsterKidRadio at gmail.com is the email address. That's MonsterKidRadio at gmail.com. I've been putting the call out wanting to know what your top three are. Your top three Universal films? your top three Hammer films, and your top three Kaiju films. I've had some people just send me messages on Facebook or emails. I've had an MP3 sent to me, and I've had a couple of voicemails sent. If you'd like to share, we'll put this in an episode, maybe at the beginning of November, maybe before then, if I can't get something figured out by next week. But I would love to include you in that episode. So again, contact information. You can call and leave a voicemail for Monster Kid Radio at 503-810-5MKR. That's 503-810-5657. Or you can send an email to the podcast. 
monsterkidradio at gmail.com is the email address. That's monsterkidradio at gmail.com. Thank you, Monsters in the Machine. I appreciate you, and I appreciate all of you listeners. Let's get into the rest of the show right now. William Castle, and I feel obligated to warn you about the next attraction you will see at this theater. The picture is The Tingler, which I directed. And for the first time in motion picture history, members of the audience, including you, will actually play a part in the picture. You will feel some of the physical reactions, the shocking sensations experienced by the actors on the screen. I guarantee that The Tingler has more shocks per minute than my last film, The House on Haunted Hill. But don't be alarmed. You can protect yourself. When you see the picture, you will be told and remember the instruction how you can guard yourself from attack by the Tingler. And now may I show you a few scenes from the Tingler? The House of Wax, the ultimate dimension in terror, comes to the screen in Stereo Vision 3D. Vincent Price, at his diabolical best, will take you room by terrible room on a journey to the ultimate chamber of horrors. Stereo Vision 3D will synthesize before your eyes the terrifying reality of it all. In Stereo Vision 3D, House of Wax is more than a movie. It's an experience you'll never forget. Perhaps it was inevitable. For years, Vincent Price has played the role of Dr. Death. For years, he has pretended to be a hideous, murdering monster. Now, he has actually become one. American International presents Vincent Price in Madhouse. Madhouse, where lunacy lives, fear lurks. Evil walks and death waits. Ah! Madhouse, an endless nightmare from which there is no return. Ah! Madhouse, a cinematic shock treatment guaranteed to scare you out of your mind. Ah! No one ever leaves Madhouse. Rated PG. Parental guidance suggested. Live from the land of light in Nebula M78, home of the mighty ultra heroes, it's Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review. are the human specimens five and six. The 28th episode of Ultraman tells their story. A series of bus accidents plagues a mountain ridge in Okutama, and the science patrol begins an active investigation of the incidents, which always seem to strike at noon. Captain Muramatsu and a mystery woman in black survive a dramatic rollover, as does Ide, who is taken to a local hospital. A man appears there, claiming to be from the nearby Cosmic Rays Research Center with the strange message that it had been invaded by space creatures named Dada. While Ide is interviewing him, he fades from view, materializing at the feet of a Dada alien who receives a command to obtain two more specimens, numbers five and six. Inhabiting the body of the lab technician, Dada determines the woman in black who has arrived at the research center has the IQ and biometrics to make a decent specimen and attacks, but Captain Muramatsu intervenes. Dada, running out of time to capture numbers five and six, grows to enormous size to confront Ultraman, and his ability to teleport makes him a troublesome opponent. Will our hero prevail, or will he become part of Dada's collection? 
Human Specimens 5 and 6, is an excellent example of the original series' tendency to shoot on location, which lends a sense of grounded realism to otherwise fantastic tales. And the ability of the special effects technicians at Tsuburaya Productions to match miniature sets to real-life footage is nothing short of astonishing. Students of art history will be aware that Dada was a name for an anti-art movement that gained traction after World War I, and the connection between the name and the character here is deliberate. Dada's design, composed by artist Toru Narita, features black and white stripes that recall patterns typical of Dadaism. The tribute has had a lasting impact. On May 19, 2016, in celebration of the 100th anniversary of Dadaism in Tokyo, the Ultra character was invited to a highly publicized meeting with an ambassador from Sweden, taking the concept of art imitating life to an incredibly new level. For Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review, this is Mark Matsky reporting. Listen. Do you hear? It's coming back. Turning the screen into a buzzing, crawling, creeping nightmare of terror. <laughs> this is the son of the original fly. Daring to explore the forbidden science of transmigration that brought horrible death to his father. You look as if you've just seen a ghost, old man. It was the fly. Fear that will fasten its choking grip on you. The rat man whose hands and feet are changed to paws. The living corpse who rose from his coffin. And the return of the fly, seeking revenge with a thousand eyes smashing anything that stands in his way. Suppose he does come here. What if Philippe does not have the mind of a human, but the murderous brain of the fly? Then he will have to be destroyed. who read the book club selection Dragon Wick know the powerful emotional impact of its many exciting moments. For as the Ladies Home Journal so daringly promised when it first published Dragon Wick, this is a story to thrill the hearts of those who loved Rebecca. Starring Jean Tierney as the woman who seeks love where it is feared to flourish, this unusual, impassioned, romantic drama now comes to the screen with its fascinating plot and its magnetic characters brought vividly to life by a splendid cast including Walter Houston, Vincent Price, Glenn Langan, Anne Revere, Spring Byington, and other outstanding artists. And you like peaches out of season, and the feel of silk sheets against your young body. And one day you will wish with all your heart you'd never come to Dragonwick. You knew it the instant our eyes first met, and everything within us met, and you know it now. You have no right to say that, to talk like this, please. You can't help yourself any more than I. Am I right? Randy, you understand what I'm getting at, don't you? Yes, I think I do. I'd like to think that you might in time marry me, Miranda. Jeff, I... I suppose you're going to say it's a man. What man, I'd like to know. She's given frostbite to every mother's son in the county. Perhaps the right one just hasn't come along yet. No, she won't find him with her nose stuck in the air, wanting what she can't get. A woman ought to get a man first and then want him. Nicholas, let me help. I don't need to be helped. Help me then. Please don't shut me out like this. Let me be unhappy with you and happy again. Let me be part of you. Let me love you and love me too.
invited to an open house where horror will be your host. The Haunted Palace. You who find a kind of macabre boyishness in the horrifying will enjoy yourselves as in ecstasy in The Haunted Palace. Starring Vincent Price, a being who lived and died and lives again. I'll not have my fill of revenge until this village is a graveyard. And intriguing Deborah Paget, whose appealing beauty inflames the blood of the bloodless. Charles, please. I... Well, I've been very busy, but I'm back now. Charles. Charles, no. We have the whole no. night before. No. His violent, no. torturous passions inflict no. both pain and terror. Lon Chaney, carrying on a family tradition of masterful motion picture horror, while the strange and feared new master of the haunted palace reaches for the skeleton of one long dead. You see? He's taken her mind, her soul, just like the others. Really, this is our great... And let's be about it! This is Vincent Price. I've been involved in many blood-chilling films like The House of Wax and The Fly, but never have I played in a more terrifying shocker than my new picture, The House on Haunted Hill. It's a story guaranteed to make you shudder with fright. See The House on Haunted Hill, if you dare. Awesome. I had the best time watching that. Let's please welcome and thank our guest again, Victoria Price, for joining us here at House on Haunted Hill. And so you're here for two days in Portland. Yeah. We have uh, Ever Walk with you tomorrow morning yeah. down at the waterfront, right? Uh, no, it's at the, oh God, the Hoyt Arboretum. Yeah. Perfect. So if anyone wants to come walk with me tomorrow morning, I'm an ambassador for a group called Ever Walk um, that's started by a woman named Diana Nyad. She's the woman who swam from Cuba to Key West. And uh, so I'm one of their ambassadors, and we're going to walk tomorrow. So if you want to come out and walk with me, please do. What time is that? It's at 10. Cool. And then we have you back here tomorrow night for House of Wax. Yeah. Our second 35 millimeter screening in the House of Christ series is happening this weekend. And then on Sunday, we have you at Movie Madness from 12.30 to 1.30. So there's going to be another signing happening then. Like I said, tonight we're doing cash for the um, signing on stage after the Q&A. But then uh, we'll be able to do cards in that at Movie Madness on Sunday. So I'm just like, think, like just having watched this film, which we all did, obviously. Uh, it's so fascinating to me because it's like a ghost movie without ghosts, right? <laughs> and yet there's these like, for a ghost movie without ghosts, there's sort of like a deeper political theme of like gaslighting and not believing women, and it's kind of contemporary in its own way. And uh, what's so funny is even when your father, Vincent Price, is up there being this like sort of semi-villain, uh, which he also is in House of Wax and in so many, I mean, Theater of Blood and Abominable Walter Fives, so many classics, you know, he's such a creepy villain. And yet, even like in this film, even when he's this villainous character, he is just oozing charm and charisma. And I mean, is that just who he was? Was, is, was he the most charismatic man that ever lived? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he was one of those people where he, he walked into a room and it was like the roof blew off and the sun shone through. He just had that persona. And I think that's one of the reasons he was such a, a successful villain, because there was something you could identify with and something that you could sympathize with. And I think we all, he always felt that the most interesting characters to play are the villains. I mean, who wants to play the nice guy, you know? There's so many layers and, and we're all multi-layered people, right? And so I think we like identifying with the people who aren't perfect because who's, who's perfect among us. But there was this way in which sort of you had the malevolence 
and then you had the charm, and then you had sort of the tongue-in-cheek part of the whole thing, and I think that was my dad's whole persona. I mean, there's really only one movie that he was truly scary in, like, without, you know, sort of unremittingly scary, and that was Witchfinder General. And, and that was a, you know, truly terrifying movie. But in some way, even though I think people think that was an extraordinary performance, it's not necessarily people's favorite movie because people want all the layers of Vincent Price, including the charm. Like a, a, a delicious cake. Yeah, there you go. The tiramisu of Vincent Price. Yes, I love that. Um, so talking about you, like I, I was blown away to meet you in Sacramento earlier this year, and I was, I was, we were at the horror convention, um, Sinister Creature Con, and I was just awestruck. Like you're so approachable, so down to earth, um, so easy to speak to. Also, like I just have to say, like looking at you, I see your father's <laughs> eyes and, and so much about him in you. Um, can, and, and, and it's mind blowing because you're also like you've done so much. You're a writer, a speaker. Uh, you 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 also like tend your father's legacy. Like, can you tell the audience about a little bit about what you do in your life? Sure. Well, you know, I, I think I was really fortunate because my parents really didn't want me to grow up thinking that I was special in any way, and and I didn't really have a sense that how I grew up was unusual. I thought, you know, oh, everybody grew up in a nine thousand square foot house with their father as a movie star, you know, and. It, you have to think about the context, right? Like, uh, I don't know if you guys saw in um, People Mag, well, it was one of those things that popped up, but it was People Magazine, that Clark Gable's grandson died this week. And uh, his his son, Clark Gable's son, was in my class in, um, in elementary school. So I grew up with all these kids of famous people, and it was really like an industry town. Like, if you grew up in a place where there was a... GM plant then probably like I have a really good friend who grew up at the Conoco headquarters in a little town in Oklahoma and everybody worked for Conoco that was kind of my childhood everybody was in the movie industry and so I sort of thought that was the most normal thing in the world but my parents understood that it wasn't because they hadn't grown up like me and they were really really determined that I not think that I was different than other kids and I'm really grateful for that because they just had no tolerance. I remember one time I said something like, oh, you know, maybe I'll get that because of dad. And my mother literally swerved across two lanes of traffic, hit the brakes. I almost flew through the windshield. She was like, you never say that again. And she said to me, I'll never forget it. She's like, do you know what a Beverly Hills brat is? And I was like, I don't know. Um, so, you know, they really raised me to be, I, I wasn't allowed to watch TV until after 7 o'clock. I was never allowed to watch TV during the daylight. Um, if I wanted to do something, I was sent to my room to read a book. And I had never had any idea that I, mine wasn't the most normal childhood in the world until, you know, now I look back and I think, oh my God. What a weird way to grow up. <laughs> Did you ever get like House on the Hill pranks played on you? I hear from yeah, my dad was totally a jokester. Yeah, I, one of my favorite stories is um, so we traveled a lot, but they made sure that I never missed school. Sorry, my back's to this. I don't go this way. And um, so we were going to New York, and I was, I don't know, how old are you when you lose your first tooth, five or six or something? And I knew I had a loose tooth, and it was going to be my very first tooth. And I was bound and determined to get my nickel that the tooth fairy was going to leave me. A nickel. What do kids get now? Like a hundred bucks? Right. Um, so that nickel I was determined to get, and I kept saying to my parents, oh my God, will the Tooth Fairy know that we're in New York? Like, will she find me? And they were like, yes, the Tooth Fairy goes everywhere, she'll be fine. So I lost my tooth, and I was so excited, I put it under my pillow, and you know, that I was gonna wake up the next morning. I woke up in the hotel room in New York, and I lifted up my pillow, excited for my nickel, and there was this disgusting, corroded old denture. <laughs> My dad had carried that with him to New York, even saving it. Where did it come from? He obviously ran and thought, that's hilarious. So first of all, I knew there wasn't a tooth fairy because he took the denture away and gave me the nickel. But uh, yeah, he'd been saving it. A hard life lesson. Right. No tooth fairy. Right. But also, 
like charmingly yeah. hilarious at the same time. No, he was a big joker. Uh, probably some of you have heard this story, but when I went to visit him on the set of Theater of Blood, um, so we had a, we would live in London on and off, and we always had a driver. And this particular driver during that time was Cockney. And my mother was English, so she and the Cockney driver would chat. I had no idea what the man was saying. I was about 10 years old. So I was sort of spacing out, and I would look at London going by. Well, this time I noticed we were in this really weird neighborhood, because we always lived in a nice neighborhood in London. And this was like, you know, getting seedier and seedier. And I kept thinking, like, what's going on? And so finally, the guy pulls up next to this dilapidated building. And the driver comes around, and he opens the door, and I get out. and. He gets back in the car, and my mother doesn't get out of the car, and I'm standing in this neighborhood, you know, with this, like, building that's falling down, and all of a sudden, all of these, like, scary people come pouring out of the building, and they have, like, you know, open sores and no teeth, and their clothes are disgusting, and they start pawing me and asking me for money, and I'm 10, and I'm like... Totally terrified, and then my father comes out of the building and he sweeps out, you know, six foot four, and he's like, "You people, get away! That's my daughter!" And he wraps his arm around me, and you know, is the big hero and sweeps me into the room, and I'm like, "Oh, my hero, my dad!" It wasn't until I saw the movie that they were—I realized they were the extras, <laughs> and he had told them to do that. <laughs> That's. Beautiful <laughs> and hilarious. Yeah. And a little horrible. <laughs> wow. I mean, like I said I wasn't gonna ask this question when I was joking about the office, but I mean like I mean what what is it like being with Vincent Price being your father, you know, besides the practical <laughs> jokes and like you you've tended his legacy really. You've by written his biography and like I mean just what is that experience like going through the world? You know, his representative. he was a really special person. And actually, uh, you know, for those of you who come up afterwards, my friend Dennis is here with me, and he knew my dad really well, too. So if you're waiting in line to talk to me, talk to Dennis. He could tell you some great stories. But he was a really special person. And he was special, I think, because, first of all, he loved life. And my brother said it really beautifully. You know, he loved life so much that life loved him back. And I, I think that the way we experience the world is the way we move through the world. And my dad was one of those people who just had this huge bright light inside of him. And the thing that gave him the most joy was bringing other people joy. So it came through in everything he did. That's why I think we still love his movie so much. And he's gone 25 years. And, you know, it's like a full house on a Friday night. And he's dead, you know, and we're still here celebrating him because his quality of life still comes through. And so to be his kid, I grew up thinking like, oh my God, it's going to be so amazing to be an adult because adults are like so full of joy and so full of life and people talk to them and they talk to people. And then I grew up and I was like, what the hell? <laughs> And, and so, I, you know, my parents weren't perfect by any stretch of the imagination. My dad wasn't perfect. You know, he, he was married three times, and the wives were <laughs> a little better than Carol Omar, but, you know, they had their issues. <laughs> um, but, you know, and he was a workaholic for sure, and I, I completely inherited that from him. But when I was just about to turn 50, I had this epiphany that I'd sort of just become this workaholic and I didn't know what the hell I was doing with my life and I was miserable working myself to death. And that happened to be the year that my dad was going to turn 100. And so there were all these celebrations all over the world that people called the Vincentennial, which was so great, right? <laughs> and so I was asked to go out because I'd written his biography and, and share stories of him. And I realized that what people really wanted was to know what he was like. And so I thought, well, how can I, I can't just talk about that. And so I thought, you know, what I really can do is talk about and sort of convey how he lived his life. And the thing that happened to me was when I did that, I remembered how he lived his life. I remembered that his legacy was this legacy of connection and this legacy of joy and bringing other people joy. And I thought, you know what? <laughs> that's how I want to live my life. And so that's really, I, first of all, one of the things I discovered in doing that 
was how awesome horror fans are. Because, you know, I, I don't actually like scary things, and I don't like scary movies, although this was hilarious. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, and I've gotten used to watching my dad's movies, but I don't really get why you guys like being scared, although I get it a little bit more. So I sort of thought I'd come into the horror world and you guys would all judge me because I was this person who didn't like what you liked. And that's not what I found. What I found that was that, first of all, we all connected around how much we all love my dad. But second of all, I realized that you guys love this genre so much and you love the actors in it so much that you've kind of formed this community, what I've come to call the heart tribe. And I looked at all of you guys and I thought, wow, I want what you guys got because I don't have that. And so I began to model my life on you to really find this way of connecting that people, you know, we're all, we all grow up and we think, you know, here's this vision of what the world is supposed to be like. And we look at the world and we think, I, where do I fit in in that? But in the horror genre, there's a place for everybody who feels like they don't fit in the mainstream world. And, you know, I really realized that that was something I wanted to have in my life and also that I wanted to give back. So that's part of what I've done with my dad's legacy. And uh, yeah, I do a lot of inspirational speaking. I write books. Um, and mainly what I do is I go around and I talk about how important it is for us all to build hard tribes with each other. Because this world is really messed up. And so if we don't have places like this where we can all find some thing that we can connect around, around love. And I always think it's ironic, right? You guys love to be scared, but you guys are the most loving people that I've ever met because you connect around what you love. And that's all we all need in this world is to connect around things that we love. And so, but you, you guys are yeah, I, I think that's super beautiful. And, and like, I mean, that's, that's the kind of energy that's like mind blowing to me going to conventions. You know, I run queer horror here at the Hollywood and, and going to conventions and representing, like you run into a lot of people that have kind of just like been through it. And you're kind of, like you get some of the actors that are kind of over it. And then you have like this beacon of light and joy over here. And it's really interesting to me that you say joy, but like your father lived really joyfully. And thinking about today's world and how kind of messed up it is, I mean, what do you think he would think about what's going on right now? Or how would, how would Vincent Price fix this situation that we're in here in the United States in 2019? You know, it's interesting because I spent uh, a, a lot of time, as, as did Dennis, you know, talking to my dad at the end of his life, and it was not a good time politically then either. Yeah. And uh, and there were a lot of really terrifying things going on, you know, and, and particularly as, as involved a lot of different communities, I mean, certainly during the 80s, you know, the whole neglect of what was going on with AIDS and, yes. AIDS, you know, the HIV AIDS community and the neglect of that, you know, my dad did one of the first PSAs uh, about AIDS. And um, so he was, you know, even from the 40s on talking about, you know, the importance of being inclusive and all of that. But he still was completely frustrated with what was going on politically. And I think, you know, the thing that he always felt and, and his passion was the visual arts and, and, and art of all kinds. And he felt that when people connected through creativity and through a passion for creativity, then you ended up feeling that there was hope for the world. And I think that's really what has happened in the horror genre. A couple of years ago, there's a guy down in uh, LA who has put together an award um, and it's called the Vincent Price Award. And, uh, the first year went to Joe Dante, and the second year went to Elvira, and, uh, and it benefits the museum my dad started in Los Angeles. But um, the first year, I was talking to Joe Dante, and uh, we were talking about how huge horror has become. And he said, I know, who would have thought that the almighty Western, you know, who makes Westerns anymore, right? And even if they make a Western, it's like the Ballad of Buster Scruggs, you know, it's like a weird, you know, Coen Brothers Western, right? <laughs> But the horror, the lowly horror film, is what Joe Dante said, has become the king of the box office. And I think that's because we don't have any faith anymore in that sort of person who's going to ride in on a white horse. They're not. They're not going to ride in on the white horse. The people who are going to save the world are people like us in this room, who actually, you know, know what it is to be, you know, 
not recognized and not seen and still find a way to show up and joy and love to one another every day. And that's what's going to save the world. Not, you know, somebody who's going to ride in on the white horse, because they're not. Absolutely. I think with horror, you know, it's, uh, I think, uh, I've learned running the Queer Horror Series here that it's, you know, we really connect with horror because there's a, there's sort of a, a empathic relationship or a sympathy for like the monsters like Frankenstein you know uh, we really feel his pain your father did what 800 billion movies 105 105 what is your if you had to pick and then I'll open it up to the audience if you had to pick a favorite what is the one that you would say to our audience to go to movie madness and I'll fight over the copy of to watch well, you know, I, I've admitted that I'm not really the horror fan, so my favorite is Laura, because I love the film Laura. And it's such a great ensemble piece, I mean, such a fantastic ensemble piece, but now that I've actually sort of gotten over my thing and I wa I've seen these movies more and more and I watch the, you know, the I love House on Honda Hill, it's, it's really, I love it. But I would have to say, of all of them, um, probably Dr. Fives. <laughs> Both of them, or just the first one? Uh, the first one. The first one. Yeah, it's real good. All right. Audience questions. Who has a question for Victoria Price? Right here in the front. So, uh, can you talk a little bit about the Death Eating Show and the legacy of Sure. So the cooking show specifically, uh, my dad did for in London, and it was he only did like I think four episodes, and it was so cheap, and the set was so flimsy that literally like he, there was one episode where he was cooking a turkey and he didn't have any place to put it because there was no counter space, so he had to put it on the floor. It was like Julia Child, but you know, like on acid. It was really bad, but so great. But the cooking thing was actually really genuine. He, well, it began because he loved to eat. <laughs> he loved to eat, and he grew up as, he was an adventurous eater and an adventurous traveler, and he really understood that you learn about a culture through their food. And so he would collect recipes and then come home and try and figure out how to make them. And then my mother would collect the design elements and they would have these amazing dinner parties where they would recreate it. Now, for me as a kid, you know, most kids have pretty banal food tastes, and I'm a super, super picky eater. Eater. So, like, my idea of a good meal was like Bob's Big Boy, you know, like a hamburger and a chocolate shake, you know. Um, and so, all that fancy food was not my thing. So, and my dad was one of those to get something right, he would cook it over and over and over and over again. So, it felt like my entire childhood, all he did was cook ratatouille. I can't even really say as <laughs> So, but yeah, he was a wonderful cook. And my favorite thing to make with him were pancakes. We'd make pancakes. Over here. Uh, don't forget the onion rings at Bob's. <laughs> uh, also, my sister was named after that movie, Laura. Oh, cool. Yeah. And I was reading the book. I was reading your book. I haven't gotten through it. But in the early part, you mentioned about in doing all of your research how you found an envelope from the FBI uh, saying that your father was not a commie. Right. <laughs> and I was wondering, during that time, during the McCarthy era, what did your father think of all of that that was going on, even though he wasn't, you know, the only thing read about him was maybe the blood in some of the <laughs> Yeah, it's actually, and it's a really timely story. Um, so, you know, the McCarthy era, a little history lesson, right? Um, everybody, Joe McCarthy and his two henchmen and a lot of Congress were accusing, the House Un-American Activities Committee were accusing people of being communists. And many of the people they were accusing were artists and writers. And people literally lost their, took their own lives, lost their entire careers, fled the country, lost their life savings. And those were the people who were blacklisted. Um, people were naming names, turning on their friends, but there were a ton of other lists, and those were the gray lists. And the gray lists were people who were named as certain things, and the studios were encouraged not to hire them, and my dad was on one of the gray lists. And the list was, the list he was on was pre-war anti-Nazi sympathizers. So it's worth unpacking in our current climate. If you were against Hitler before we declared war on Hitler, theoretically a good thing, right? 
you were probably a communist. That was the logic. And so, yeah, my dad um, didn't work for a number of years. And um, actually, you know, the, the story really relates to House of Wax. So he didn't work for a number of years, and it was really, really devastating. And when his name was finally cleared, um, he actually was, FBI agents came to the house, and he signed all these documents. And uh, I'll come back to the story of finding them. But he, he told me this story. And he told me this story because I was really fascinated because when I went to high school, in my AP history book, there was a picture of Joe McCarthy and his two henchmen. And I looked at the name of one of them, and it was the same name as a girl in my class. So I went to the library and looked it up, and it was her dad. And I remember thinking, like, oh my God, you know, her dad was one of like the evil empire, you know? And it was this real object lesson like, anybody's dad can be anything. Like, my dad played, was the king of horror and the nicest man in the world, and her dad was this nice, like, Swedish looking guy, and he'd, like, you know, been responsible for, uh, you know, turning people in. So um, so I had talked to my dad about it. I was really fascinated. And Lillian Hellman was this big hero of mine. So he told me the whole story. And he told me that after his name was cleared, he was offered two parts in the same week. And historically, he usually went back to the theater when he sort of needed to kind of get his, get his sort of acting chops back. And he was offered a part in a play called We're No Angels, which later became a movie um, with, uh, I think it was Peter Ustinov and um, Humphrey Bogart. My mom actually did the costumes for it. But the, he actually didn't take the play, he took the movie. And he took the movie because it had this new technology. He knew nothing about technology, my dad. He could barely turn on a radio. But he knew that the industry was technology driven. So he took the movie and that was House of Wax. And he had no idea it would be this whole new renaissance for his career. He had no idea it would be the hit that it would be. But I think one of the reasons it was such a great performance is because it's the story of somebody whose life work was taken away from them. It was a whole metaphor for the McCarthy era. Um, but when I found the document, it was like the last thing I found in the house. And it was a house like three houses after the house where he'd signed the document. He'd hidden it behind the air conditioner. And uh, in it, he talked about he was forced to say things that I know he didn't believe, like anyone who pleads the fifth is un-American. And, you know, I think it was such an interesting thing because I was very politically active and he used to say, don't get on a list, you know, be careful you don't get on a list. But I think he saved it. First of all, he didn't want anyone to find it because he was embarrassed by it. But also, he saved it just in case he ever needed it again. So the thing that's interesting is talk about fear. I think my dad's greatest fear was that the thing that he had spent his whole life creating, which was his relationship with his fans and his career, would be taken away from him by some power that, that you know, that was outside of himself and outside of his control. So that's, that's a great question. Wow, over here. Yeah. Which is one of our favorite movies. But um, did he ever talk about working with Jean Tierney? Because you know she went on to kind of lose her mind. Yeah, he did three, three or four films with her. Dragonwick as well. Yeah. Um, which was, I think, a very important movie in his career. Yeah. He first of all, he talked about that he thought that you know she was an underrated actress. Because, you know, she's, she's, I just saw Dragonwick, they screened it in MoMA in New York, and it was great to see it in 35 millimeter on the big screen. It was really amazing. Um, and she's very subtle, you know, and she has this sort of imperfect, perfect beauty, you know. Um, but he felt that she had this incredibly tragic life, you know, so many things happened to her. She was pregnant and met somebody who I think had like, German weasels or something, and her child, uh, you know, ended up being ill. I mean, she just had this incredibly tragic life, um, and I think it was really heartbreaking for him. But he he adored her. Yeah, they, there was a reunion for Laura toward the end of their. I have a great picture of all of them together: Dane Andrews and my dad. And yeah, and he was great friends, of course, with Judith Anderson and Clifton Webb. So they were all great friends. It was a great cast, and Otto Preminger was difficult. <laughs> with a name like that. Have you seen all of his films? No. But I've seen some really bad ones. Um, 
It's always amazing sometimes, like the British Film Institute will only uh, do screenings of films that they actually own. So they did this, like, I came over to London and they did this screening of a film, I can't remember what it was called even, I think it's The Jackals or something, it's set in South Africa. It is the worst movie, oh my God. It's like every, the people could barely act their way out of a paper bag. I mean, it was like so terrible. And my dad was really like over the top and hammy and not very good either, but he was so much better than anyone else. And I know he only took it because he'd never been to South Africa. He was like, oh good, I want to go to South Africa. It was so bad. And then I had to come up on stage and speak for like 45 minutes about it. I was like, what am I gonna say? That's terrible. I mean, that's the true horror to it. Uh, over here. Uh, what was Halloween like here? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. So my dad, um, first of all, I, don't, I never liked Halloween, but it had nothing to do with my dad. My mother was a costume designer. And so, you know, I would say I want to be a black cat and picture I'd be like in leotards with like some whiskers. Oh no, my mother would make me into like a Broadway show, you know? <laughs> so nothing, you know, as a kid, you just want to like, I want to be a cowgirl or whatever. No, I had to be an orange clown. So I was always a little traumatized <laughs> around Halloween, but my dad always made it really fun. We had this RV, it was like, it was called a Clark Cortez. And I was only allowed to have one candy a week as a kid. And it was a hard candy. It wasn't even like a Milky Way bar. Um, but Halloween, I could have whatever we took. So I was very serious about Halloween. And I would do research on to which street in Beverly Hills had the best candy. And I came up with this theory, I'm nine years old, that Palm Drive in Beverly Hills had the best candy. I don't know where I got this idea. So I said to my dad, we have to go to Palm Drive. So all my girlfriends and I got to go in the RV and we would park at the top of Palm Drive and my mother would have snacks in the RV and my dad would take us trick or treating. And it took me a while to catch on because I was so like focused on the candy. But what would happen is we'd run up and you know knock on the door and they'd give us the candy, right? One little candy in those days, which to me was like, you know, Nirvana. In the meantime, I'm like looking at my candy and getting ready to shove it in my face and my dad would jump out from behind the bushes and scare everybody. So, <laughs> so he, he had fun with it. So that's for me, it was all about the candy. That's the way it should be. <laughs> it's Halloween with the surprise jumping out at you. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Hey, right here. What was your Yeah, it's an interesting story. So he, Vincent Price was not a stage name. He was the third Vincent Price. So Vincent, Dr. Vincent Clarence Price invented baking powder, and that was his grandfather. And uh, he actually was a homeopathic doctor, and he couldn't grow facial hair for a man, you know, the grandfather of somebody who had one of the most famous mustaches in the world. He couldn't grow facial hair. And so he looked too young and nobody wanted to go and, you know, be his patient. So he would fool around in the kitchen and he invented a baking powder. And so he then ended up having this huge food empire. It was a household name in the 1800s. He had cookbooks and breakfast cereals and extracts of vanilla, and uh, he was really, really famous. And so his son, his youngest son, Vincent Price, um, ran one of the largest candy companies in the United States in St. Louis. And uh, when my dad was born, he was the youngest, and he was dubbed the Candy Kid. Uh, and uh, he grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, and, and they were an upper middle class family, went to private schools, and from a very young age, he knew he was different than the other kids because he loved art. And because he was the youngest, his older brother was this really, really talented musician. He was made to go into the family business, and uh, he didn't want to. And, but my dad, because he was the youngest, was allowed to do whatever he wanted. And I think that was a big part of who my dad was. First of all, he knew he was different because he loved art. And in the Midwest, that made you a weirdo. And second of all, he knew he'd been given a gift to be allowed to do what he wanted, not made to go into the family business. And his brother actually died of, he was an alcoholic and was pretty miserable. And so he felt, I think that was a big part of why he would go out and say to parents, allow your kids to be who they want to be. Because he felt almost like that was his obligation because he'd been given this gift. And his, uh, apparently his dad, whom I never met, they both died 20 years before I was born, but he, the second Vincent Price was apparently 
as nice or nicer than my dad, like the nicest man on the planet and uh, wonderful man. Other questions? Hit the back here. <coughs> kind of an interesting thing with uh, Christopher Lee and uh, Peter Lorre at uh, Bella Lugosi's funeral. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I think it was just, um, it was uh, Peter Lorre and my dad. Um, my dad gave, uh, actually gave the eulogy at Peter Lorre's funeral, but yeah, about the, the you want to tell the story? <laughs> well, he said, I, I, I actually forget the story, but he said something about, do you think we should like stab him or something to make sure he's dead? <laughs> <laughs> that was Peter Lorre. <laughs> Uh, and Bella would go see you. But they were all great friends, you know. Chris and my dad had the same birthday, May 27th, 11 years apart, and they were great friends. And Peter Cushing was the day before, May 26th. And uh, Boris and my dad were really, really dear friends from the 1930s. Um, Bela, not as much. They didn't know each other as well, but Basil Rathbone also. So they all loved being horror actors. Legends. Yep. That's wild. Uh, other questions? Hey, right here. Um, he has such a huge art collection, right? And I know a lot of it is around. Um, do you have any of it? So what, I, what is it? I kept a few pieces that really meant something to me. I actually, um, I, I don't live anywhere. I'm intentionally homeless. I literally, everything I own is in a 10 by 10 storage unit. And I've lived on the road, literally homeless for three years on purpose. Um, but I had to keep a few things, and so they're in my best friend's house. Um, and whenever I go stay with her and, and her partner, I, I'm like, oh, look, there's, you know, but you forget about them. But one of them was an angel. Um, it was this angel from the 1600s in Italy. And as a little kid, I thought it was always our Christmas card, was that angel. And I thought it was our personal angel. It took me a long time to realize it had been alive for 400 years, you know, in existence for 400 years before I came along. So I, I, I kept that. And um, a, a few other small things. But really, for me, the gift is that I made sure, I'm, my background is I'm an art historian as well, and so I was in charge of making sure that everything went to the museums that my dad wanted it to go to. And so the gift is that I can go to these museums and see the pieces that I grew up with, but so can everyone else. And that's actually the beauty of it, because he never thought you owned art, he thought you just care took it. So it's really fun to come around the corner and go, oh God, there's that piece, I love that. You know, and see it and visit it, and then, and then go away. That's awesome. Anybody else? Anybody else? Oh, right over here. Hi. So my first exposure to your dad was a uh, egghead on Batman. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, this last month, I saw him in a movie called Champagne for Caesar. Yes. And he was fantastic. And I'm just wondering, did he ever express a desire to do more straight act comedies? But that kind of kind of yeah, he loved doing comedy. And you know, it, it's interesting because the great comedians loved to work with him. Carol Burnett loved to work with him. Uh, uh, Red Skelton, he and Red were really dear friends and did a lot of skits together and things like that. So yeah, and even in his kind of woman, you know, where he plays that ham actor, Howard Hughes wrote a whole, had a whole last scene written because he loved that character of my dad being the ham actor and that whole last scene of the movie was actually added on because he thought it was so great. But Champagne for Caesar, hilarious. He's so over the top. No, he and he was a very funny man. Um, and and to sort of, my stepmother was equally funny. My mother was a very funny person. And often it was like being in a Noel Coward play. You know, I would just watch the banter going back and forth. He was, he was a very, very quick and funny person and had a great sense of humor. And I think it comes through in, you know, in, all, in most of the horror stuff too. You know, there's this sense that, you know, he's, there's a little nudge, nudge, wink, wink, and the eyebrow goes up. <laughs> That's why it's so funny. He's absolutely looking back at yeah. you. Uh, what was his favorite role? Do you know? Well, uh, you know, it's hard to say because I think there were, I mean, Theater Blood, you know, he loved so that bad. part. 
Um, but one of the movies he often said was one of his favorites is a movie that's really, really hard to find. It's called The Eve of St. Mark. Um, and it was a very poetic war film. Um, so there were parts that were really important to his career, like House of Wax or Dragon Wick, you know, some of the Rod, Roderick Usher, things like that. Tomb, uh, I think uh, he felt that, you know, some like Tomb of Lygia, some of those parts. But, um, you know, I think as an, what's important as an actor is really different than what's important to your career. So. so I think we have time for about two more questions. So raise your hands if you got a good one. Hey, in the back here. Uh, yeah, so he, the way that came about, my dad did a TV show uh, called Mod Squad, and uh, in his episode, yeah, and in his episode, um, he was spent most of the time with Peggy Lipton on in that episode, as it all turned out, and he and she just absolutely hit it off, and Peggy Lipton was married to Quincy Jones. So when, uh, and Quincy Jones, of course, produced Thriller. And so when he and Quincy Jones and, and Michael Jackson were sort of coming up with the idea, it was Quincy who called my dad. And uh, they just sort of threw it together and they signed a little piece of paper uh, in the office when he recorded it. He recorded it in one take. And, um, and that was that. Nobody had any idea it was going to become the biggest selling record of all time. Uh, but, you know, for me, I feel like the, the gift of that record for my dad, there, was, there were times where he felt like he had sort of gotten a raw deal, but frankly, he signed the piece of paper. His agent wanted to kill him. Um, <laughs> but he always said yes and always just followed his heart. But, you know, for as long as there's Halloween, there's going to be Thriller, which means that generation after generation will get introduced to this entire set. I mean, that's pretty cool. You don't, you don't get more iconic than Thriller, for real. Okay, one last question right here. Um, tell us about the Edward Scissorhands experience. Mm. That's a great question. Thanks for asking that. So Edward Scissorhands, I got to go back a little. Um, my dad was doing a, a TV show for Disney called Read, Write, and Draw, and I was teaching kids how to uh, tell stories. And uh, somebody at Disney said, you know, there's this young animator here who's this huge fan of yours, and he'd love to meet you. And my dad said, oh, of course, you know. And so he goes down, there's this guy with this, like, black spiky hair, and he's doing these beautiful pen and ink drawings. And my dad of all, he collected many kinds of art, but his passion was drawing. And he saw these beautiful pen and ink drawings, and he said, oh, this guy's really talented. Anyway, he's, the guy said, I've written this little movie called Vincent about a little boy named Vincent Malloy. He wants to grow up to be Vincent Price, and would you narrate it? And so my dad did. And then Tim wrote Edward Scissorhands, and a number of other things for my dad, but my dad was only able to do Edward Scissorhands. How old was he? And when my dad did it, uh, 80, let's see, let's see. 78. And how, how old was he when, he when he passed away? Uh, 82. So, yeah, it was his last thing. Um, but, you know, to me, what a gift, right? I mean, this is a man who had a 65-year career who was absolutely passionate about his career. And he got to go out with this part that I think kind of encapsulates all the parts of him. You know, he was a beautiful speaker of verse, so the whole little limerick thing is, a you know, the sweetness of my dad. Were you on the set? Uh, not on that set, no. I um, I was in Florida, so, for my little part in that film. Yeah, I mean, that's what makes that movie so special. It's such a special movie, but especially seeing your dad as that scientist. Yeah. And how loving he is. Yeah. It really does kind of encapsulate everything you need to know yeah. about him. Which is awesome. It's so true. Wow. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Thank you all. Enjoy the class, everybody. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of the podcast. I hope it was worth waiting for. I hope you had a good time. If nothing else, I hope it helped to remind you of better times when movie theaters were up and running and at capacity and you didn't have to wear a mask and, you know, hand sanitizer wasn't everywhere you looked. And, you know, I mean, that was a pre-COVID recording. And I was just, just listening to it made me think of a, a time that was just way so long ago. It was only a couple of years, but it feels like forever ago because 
life is so different now. Even if your theaters opened up and you go to the movies, I doubt they're filled to capacity, right? It just, uh, I don't know. It's just, it was a fun night. I didn't get to go see House of Wax. I wasn't able to do that, but I was so glad I was there for House on Haunted Hill. And the questions were great. It was presented by Queer Horror here in Portland. You can find them at queer-horror.com. If you want to know more about what they're up to, I don't know if they're doing anything these days because of COVID and, you know, the Hollywood theater kind of locking things down. That's where they were presenting a lot of their stuff, that sort of thing. But if you're interested, go check them out. I'll put a link in the show notes. Also in the show notes, you're going to find links to everything we've talked about in this episode. So if you want to pick up your own copy of Victoria Price's books, yeah, there's been more than one since that recording. I'll make sure there's a link there for it. And I can tell you the way of being lost, I... Mm, I know I talked about it at the beginning of the show. I'm not going to talk about it again because once again, I'll probably start tearing up, but man, it, it's just so good. So good. You can also pick up the box set for Ultra Q or Ultraman. There's even just a link that'll take you straight to Amazon. We're an Amazon affiliate. So anytime you buy anything through that link or any of the other Amazon links you see on the website, you're helping out Monster Kid Radio. And believe you me, I really need the help right now. Even though I am working a day job, I honestly don't know if it's going to be enough to pay the bills as I move forward. So uh, yeah, we need to bring in some more income. Not going to get desperate about it though. Just letting you know how you can help. Anyway. Uh, what's coming up next week on the show? I have no idea. Uh, you know, I do have that spider baby recording that I'm sitting on. Uh, I might be able to do something with that, but it is going to take some fancy editing because of issues on my side of the recording. I might be able to put something together before then. There will be something. Bottom line is there will be something at monsterkidradio.net next week. Let's talk about the streams. So this past Tuesday at the Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash monsterkidradio, I did not do a live presentation the way that I normally do. Instead, I just programmed like a six hour loop and just hit repeat and let it run and actually let it run a lot longer than I meant to. But there were people watching the whole time. At least that's what Twitch was telling me. So I wanted to leave that going as long as I could. On Saturday, I still want to put something together. I've had a pre-show submitted to me by Scott Morris. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but I'm looking forward to checking that out and sharing it with everybody. In terms of the movies, I'll probably just do another grab bag of films. I'm not really sure what's going to turn up yet, but I'll try to find some obscure stuff, some crowd favorites, some pleasers, some surprise, you know, just whatever. However, I work until 6 p.m. Pacific at the day job, which means I'm not going to be able to check in the way that I normally do throughout the day. However, I'm going to try to program it so that right at 6 p.m. Pacific, when I get off work, I can just slide over to the webcam and pop in and we can start chatting it up. So whatever's going to happen next week, which are actually this weekend, which will include the movie Bucket of Blood for sure. I think I made a commitment to that. At 6 p.m. Pacific, I'm going to pop in and we're going to chat it up and hang out and then probably watch another movie together. It's kind of hard to think about the future in terms of those kinds of things. I, I have this kind of big picture future vision right now because I do have a new place lined up. I am starting to move in. Huge thanks to friends of the show, Jeff, Tom, and Shanna. The three of you really made the other day a lot easier. And man, Jeff, oh boy, if I could get you a medal or something, I would because Dude, you were the hero that day. Uh, you were using your dolly to move stuff around, going up and down stairs, up that three flights to the new place, even though your knees were already blown out. Dude, I appreciate you so much. And Tom and Shanna, I appreciate you too. And I'm looking forward to being your neighbor soon. I think that's about it. While my activity has slowed down a little bit with everything going on, you can always contribute or be part of the community over on Twitter, Facebook pages, Facebook groups, Discord, Reddit, all the links over at monsterkidradio.net, as well as a link to the band whose music we're playing this week. So head over there. We'll talk to everybody next week. Until then, Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio LLC. All the original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 3.0, unported license. Of course, that doesn't apply to the song Goat's Eye. That is copyright 2021. Mullet Monster Mafia. You can find them at mmmbrazil.bandcamp.com and check out their album Inferno. It is the word Inferno, but there are periods after every letter. So it's I period N period F. But just look it up. I'll make sure there's a link in the show notes. Check out the entire album. It's great. I've already played some of their music here on the show in the past. I love them. 
I hope you love them too. My name is Sarah Kim Cook, and I'm out of here. Ciao.